sharing the way that you think and your unique point of view is a big part of what what fuels content marketing and also um, helps elevate your thought leaders and your the technical experts within your firm uh, to kind of show off a little bit, to, to show what they do, to show what they're capable of doing, um, and, and to really demonstrate your, your point of view and your expertise. Episode 137. This is the Business of Architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Today we're joined by a very special guest. A while ago I came across the book, Bold Brand, The New Rules for Differentiating, Branding, and Marketing Your Professional Services Firm. Great book, so I decided to bring the author here onto the show so he could spill all of his wisdom for you. He is also the co-founder of a successful visual identity and branding firm, Miles Herndon. Today's guest is writer, author, and speaker, Josh Miles. First of all, I just want to welcome you out. Welcome, Josh, to Business of Architecture. Well, thank you so much. Now, I'm holding right here your awesome book, Bold Brand. And I want to recommend that to all of our listeners, Bold Brand. Just want to ask you what inspired you to write this book, Josh? Well, I'd love to say that I uh, had a lifelong dream of becoming the next great American author, but that's... Uh, actually not the case. I was uh, actually on an airplane flying to a speaking engagement and I thought, man, I just don't have enough speaking engagements. And I thought, I bet if I had a book, I'd have more speaking engagements. So maybe I should, maybe you should write down some of the ideas and thoughts that we've had. And uh, the book has, has been a really great thing for that. And, and of course, the more I get out in front of people around the world, then uh, the more new clients we get from other parts of uh, parts of the world. Great. So it's worked out well for you then. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, so the short answer is it's a it's been a great business development tool for us. Yep. What kind of speaking engagements are you doing? Um, I've spoken the most with a group called the SMPS, which is Society for Marketing Professional Services, and uh, spoken to a lot of uh, different associations, organizations, and uh, uh, occasionally colleges as well. All right, Josh. So, what are you evangelizing? What message are you spreading? So uh, we have, unsurprisingly, by the title of our book, we had specialized a lot in working on branding and marketing for professional services firms. And uh, professional services firms, uh, on the whole, I think are woefully behind in marketing and branding. Uh, Even until recently, many firms found it unethical to market themselves. So I'm sure these are things that you're familiar with. Until recently, has there been a change that I wasn't aware of? Until recently as in in the last 20 years. (laughs) No, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, wait, are are architecture firms now recognizing the importance of it? (laughs) (laughs) I think the ones that do are still in the minority. The good news is it's not 0%. It's uh, it's probably more like 25 or 30%. Well, and to give them credit, I think, I think they do. It's just a difficulty of figuring out what exactly that means and how it's done. Well, I think especially in the traditional model where you bring partners on who are, you know, the seller doers and they're, they're building their firm based on their own backs. And it's, it's just a little bit different model to think about how to grow through, um, through marketing and and advertising and content and brand, uh, as opposed to just off of relationships, which I think that relationship piece isn't going away anytime soon. I think that's still a huge part of how you grow and keep your best clients, but um, you know, doing marketing and branding and great website marketing are other ways to build new avenues and create new relationships. Josh, one thing that, that struck me about your book is that here's, here's a graphics guy and you come across as a graphics guy, a branding guy, um, who, un, yeah. who gets marketing. I'm a weird one, maybe. 
I know, <laughs> fish out of water. No, is, is that a true generalization though? I generally, when I see uh, a lot of graphics people, it's very hard to find a graphics person or a design person that has that strong design background who also gets the fundamentals of marketing. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I think when you bring most designers a problem, they want to go off into their room and they want to work up a great design and come back and show you their graphic solution. Um, whereas that we think about it a little bit differently, we think that uh, business objectives and strategy should really drive what we do from a language perspective first. Uh, and then the design solution should be built on what the strategy and language solution is and not the other way around. Well, hey, let's dive into that a little bit and just talk about what that really looks like. Sure. So what makes your process different than what an architecture firm might get if they were to go to their local uh, typical a agency, get a logo, get a website? Well, one of the, the main things that we do is um, I think our discovery process is a little bit different and maybe not unlike what most architects would do for their clients, which we want to bring everybody in the room who's going to get a vote in the process eventually and make sure that they've all been heard and that we're getting all the different points of view and really understanding how that firm wants to position themselves in the marketplace. Um, and so, of course, outside of getting all the internal perspective, we also want to get the client's perspective as well. So um, going out and interviewing somewhere between five and 10 of their best clients and hearing, okay, what really makes uh, this firm different? And why would you choose them over another firm? Or maybe occasionally, why would you work with another company? And why would you choose them over our client? And to find out those areas where the things that they had said internally and the things that we heard externally overlap is where we can find some really sticky opportunities for messaging. Um, and the converse is also true. The things that the firm was saying internally that we didn't hear their clients say, those are great opportunities that we can say, okay, are those things that we want to intentionally pursue or are those things that we, we believe about ourselves, but maybe they're not all that accurate. And can you give me an example of some of these conversations that you found in working with some of your clients that, that their clients have been having and how you've translated that into the work that you do? Yeah, I think sometimes just bringing in some of those key statements and say, man, when we talk to uh, so-and-so who's an owner's rep, here's what they had to say about your process and why they would choose you. And, and frankly, they see you as, you know, being really great at sports or, you know, stadiums or whatever. Um, and they don't see you as strong in other places. And here's why they said that. And I, I think bringing those conversations back to our clients really helps to open up their eyes too to maybe get a little brighter light shined upon uh, who they are. The, the subtitle of your book is The New Rules for Differentiating Branding and Marketing a Professional Services Firm. So what are the new rules? Well, I think... Uh, one of the first rules is that you can <laughs> brand and differentiate your professional services firm. Um, you know, it's so easy to look out into the market and just see what's similar about all of these firms or, uh, you know, one of our favorite games is, you know, open up the two websites of your firm and your closest competitor. And if you cover up the logos, can you actually tell the difference between the two? You know, they both have a big shiny, photo of a building on the home page and a white background and your logos in the upper left and your navs across the top and a little bit of text under that main photo, maybe a slider, you know, when all the visual elements start to blur together, um, that's where that strategy and messaging really becomes uh, paramount. That if there's not a difference in what I'm reading and what I'm understanding about your firm, um, you're starting to lose real opportunities to uh, do anything but fall into that commodity space. Right. So that's one of the new rules is that you can brand your firm. You can use this cohesive message between messaging and, and visual imagery. What else, Josh? So, um, you know, one of the other things that when, when I published this book three years ago was, was pretty terrifying for most firms. And I think there's still plenty who can't quite figure out how to step into it is this idea of social media. So, um, you know, should our three years ago, I was getting the question all the time, should our firm even be on social media? Like maybe we should just skip it, <laughs> which I'm guessing, uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, many firms were saying, should we even have a website? Like, should we just skip it? So I, again, I think, um, 
you know, most architecture firms are a little bit slower to, uh, to jump into, uh, new technologies, especially when it comes to marketing. I think maybe when it comes to, to BIM and things like those that actually, um, deliver a better work product, I think architects are a lot faster to jump in. But again, this marketing thing is a little bit new for, for a lot of firms. Um, so social media is another one of those areas where, um, man, there's such a benefit. I, I mean, if you walk into a room in, in the most conservative, um, slow moving corporation you can think of or institution, and you ask everyone in that building who has a Facebook page, I, I would venture to guess almost every hand in the room would go up. So I think one of the, the big uh, points of confusion is it's easy to mistake these stodgy, slow moving organizations uh, for the people who work within them. And even though the, the organization may have a reputation for being slow and you wouldn't think this higher ed or uh, government or, or corporation may not be very active on, on Twitter or YouTube or whatever, maybe that's fair, but the, the folks who are inside of there are still just as active on social media as, as the folks inside of your firm. So I think there's a lot of opportunities. Again, it doesn't outdo relationship, but if you can, you're in a relationship business. Why not extend that relationship to the social media sphere as well? Okay. Well, let's talk about that. What are some of the benefits of being on social media for architecture firms? Yeah, I think one of the, um, one of the easiest ones to tackle is, is LinkedIn. So I think that's just kind of a no brainer. It's definitely, um, from some of the research we've seen specifically through the content marketing institutes, uh, research, um, LinkedIn drives the most qualified leads. LinkedIn also drives the most uh, sales opportunities of any of the social networks. So if, if I were just going to invest as one, in one as an architect, LinkedIn would be where I'd want to want to go first. So I'd want to make sure I've got a good professional headshot, that I've got a good headline that describes what I do, that you know general work history is correct, um, and that everybody in my firm is linking back to the same page. So <laughs> early on, LinkedIn kind of created company pages for us. And then if you created one later, you may have duplicates throughout some of your employees. So it's a good thing to just have everybody go check and click on the company name and make sure it's actually connecting back to your firm. Okay. So above and beyond having a good headline, having that good image and that photo, what should architects be doing on LinkedIn? Uh, so one of the things that I talk about a lot when it comes to social media is you sort of run the risk of the social media waterfall that if you, if you say something on Twitter and nobody's there to see at that moment, it goes over the waterfall and it's gone forever. Um, so unless you're a real power user and you curate groups and, you know, to make sure and keep an eye on particular individuals, um, things that you say on most social networks, uh, are kind of here now and gone in a moment. Um, LinkedIn is a little bit different where I found that things that I post on LinkedIn for days and days after I'll still have people liking and sharing and finding them and, and things tend to stick around a little bit longer and be a little bit slower to, uh, completely be gone. So I think even having weekly activity on LinkedIn, uh, to maybe share an article or post something that's happening or just to post a thought that's. It's going through your head. I think uh, LinkedIn is a, is a great way to get out in front of those professional contacts. Great. So I have, so say I, I post something on LinkedIn, how does that help me? So I think, um, you know, again, in a relationship business, I think it all comes back to top of mind awareness and likability. So, you know, anyone could probably think of the local car dealer who is uh, top of mind with you because he shouts at you on the radio or the television, or you see his billboards or you drive by and he's got balloons and the, the hoods are popped. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to go there to buy my next car though. I just, I know his name cause he won't shut up. So top of mind doesn't always get me a sale. Um, but if I can combine top of mind with likability, I think that's where you're a little bit more likely to get invited to that next project. Uh, and maybe have a little bit more direct path to the short list next time around. Great. So you've given our listeners a good tip for utilizing LinkedIn, talking about the power of that social media network. Tell me a little bit about the other networks. What what kind of other stuff are you seeing? Yeah, I think some of the other things that are um, 
interesting right now. Um, a lot of people are talking about uh, Periscope, which is kind of the new, the new shiny thing, which is uh, related to Twitter. So if you've got a Twitter account, you can easily create Periscope. But Periscope just allows you to uh, basically live broadcast video. So if we wanted to right now, we could do a little Periscope and uh, broadcast our podcast recording <laughs> and share that with all of our Twitter followers. So if you are on Periscope, you'll receive a notification when anybody you follow is broadcasting live. So um, I think nobody knows for sure, <laughs> or maybe knows really well how that's going to all pan out, but it's a really interesting thing that maybe most people are not, uh, not on or not participating in just yet. Are you using it yet? Josh, uh, I have just downloaded it in the last couple of weeks. So I've, uh, I've enjoyed checking in on a few people that I know and checking in on a few live events. So it was cool to be able to see a little clip from a speaker who was presenting at a conference that I was unable to attend. So, um, that was cool. And I also got the perspective of him from stage speaking. So it was, you know, uh, his, his phone presumably sitting on the podium as he was talking. Um, I think the other one from the sort of digital perspective that is far less new and far less shiny, but uh, maybe the most important is is email marketing. And I think, uh, you know, I always say email marketing is sort of like they say in Spider-Man that uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And how you use email, the way people used email marketing for a long time was the old uh, dreaded monthly newsletter. And, uh, there's nothing I get more excited about than seeing in my inbox, a whole bunch of things that say October monthly newsletter. So uh, it's exciting. Yeah. 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 It is. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it just gets the juices flowing. So, um, but in all seriousness, I think, uh, email, uh, one of the stats that I saw most recently was it has something like a, a 45 to one return on investment. So for every dollar you invest in email, you get 45 back. I don't think there's any other medium out there that's espousing to be quite so strong on the ROI, but, but I think it has a lot to do with how you use it, uh, and making wise use of, of that list and how you build and grow and communicate with that list. Awesome. Interesting. So what are some, some alternatives to the typical newsletters that are boring and dry and not good advertising or marketing mediums? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, one of the things that we've started doing just this year, and uh, we've encouraged a lot of our clients to do the same, is to think of email as a one-to-one -one communication tool, and you know, just send out a note and tell tell that one person that you're speaking to what's going on in your life, and make it engaging, make it interesting, and just share. Okay, here's here's just a thought that I have. Um, we've dialed back to where my business partner and I take turns sending a weekly email and, and we're pretty good about getting that out every week. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll create some automatic personalization. So it feels a little bit more direct and we'll, we'll write it from a very, uh, one-to-one -one perspective. So I'll ask questions, I'll ask people to respond and, and, you know, a fair amount of our, our list will respond directly to that email and give me feedback on, on the questions that I posed or tell me what they think about those ideas. Um, you know, I think there's also room to say, here's a project we're working on, or here's an ask, or here's something I'd like to sell you. But that's a very small part of what we use email for. And again, um, I think it's a huge opportunity to continue, uh, to warm up that list, uh, and thinking of it as a long-term relationship medium and not just as something to spam people with, uh, you know, bragging about the latest things that we've done. Awesome. Well, you inspired me um, to do to do a little Periscope. So this is the first business of architecture Periscope right here. So Excellent. I don't have that many followers, but I do think Periscope is pretty cool. So if you are not following business of architecture on Periscope, make sure you do because you're going to get little goodies like this. Um, if you're one of the lucky people that is already following me or you see this Twitter message, uh, basically this is I'm just interviewing Josh Miles here with Miles. Um, Miles Herndon It's the name of the firm. And we're getting in some awesome information about branding, about marketing. We were talking about social media. And so you can't hear Miles now because I'm, I have my headphones on. But anyways, what, what are we looking at there behind you? What city are you in, Josh? 
Uh, so we're in Indianapolis. This is the uh, Soldiers and Sailors Monument, which is on uh, Monument Circle, downtown Indianapolis. So this is the, the center of the city. I'll zoom up a little bit here so you can see the top. Uh, I believe the stat is we're about 15 feet uh, shorter than the Statue of Liberty <laughs> in New York. Wow. But this was built, uh, I thought you might ask me this. Fascinating. So I looked this up before our call. Uh, the monument was constructed between 1888 and 1901, and it was constructed to honor uh, folks from the state of Indiana who participated in the Civil War and the American Revolution, and there are a couple other wars and conflicts that are honored by this monument. It's a pretty cool thing. It's not uh, not something you could build again today. Very cool. Well, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the, the periscope here. I'm getting, I'm already getting some hearts, getting some followers here who've been watching us. So <laughs> for those of you who Very are nice. watching us, thanks for tuning in. And uh, it's just kind of fun. I think we'll be doing more of this. Uh, that was a good suggestion, Joss, to kind of, you know, periscope is really cool like that to be able to get sort of the behind the scenes, more unscripted, you know, engage and let people know what we're up to. So very, very cool. Yeah, absolutely. I think the way that I've seen a lot of other people use it is when they're about to go do something big. So it's, it's a really cool, you feel like a true insider when you're like, Hey, I'm about to go on stage and here's what's going on. And this guy's on there right now and I'm getting ready. I'm psyched. All right, guys, wish me luck. You know, it's just a quick hop on, hop off kind of thing. Uh, or again, like the presenter I saw uh, last week, you could just turn it on while you're speaking and let it run live and let your your uh, fans and followers just kind of watch you uh, uh, from the sidelines, I guess. Very cool. I'm going to go and stop this here. So, I mean, what we're talking about is really some game changers in the way that relationships are happening. I mean, you talked about that, how almost the digital is an, is an extension of the relationships that we're used to forming offline, you know, and how kind of the two are merging. I think that Periscope example is an excellent example of really bringing people together, even us talking here on Skype so far apart and yet being able to have this conversation and then later broadcast it to thousands of people. Sometimes, Josh, it's it's just hard to to wrap your mind around that and see the opportunities there because it seems like we have so much opportunities, but we're not really taking full advantage of it. Yeah, and I think um, you know, architects are are designers, and thinking with that design thinking frame of mind is really just about problem solving. So, um, as much as it may be unnatural to think, oh, I'm going to broadcast my life online as I'm doing architecture. Um, you know, some of these things can be really intimidating. I get that, but there are so many, um, just analogs to the, the normal everyday thing that this social thing is like, or kind of replaces or it enhances. Uh, and as we already mentioned, a lot of it just goes back to, to building relationship, you know, as much as you'd love to, you know, run over and meet somebody for lunch today and hang out and just have a long lunch and hang out and talk you have a chance to kind of spread a little bit more of that relationship across to hundreds or thousands or, you know, tens of thousands of followers at the same time. So, um, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, so between my, my wife and I, my wife is, uh, also uh, here at miles Herndon. She's, uh, our CFO handles all of our finances. She's much more likely to share lots of things on the personal side. So between she and I, Anytime I go somewhere and run into somebody, they seem to know everything that's going on with our life because they either follow her on Facebook or follow me on Twitter or Instagram or Twitter, who knows what else. But um, but it's it's a really cool thing that I feel like people can stay engaged with who we are and what we're up to, even though I don't get a chance to see everybody all the time. Yeah, that's just amazing. You know, in the in the past, I would say maybe the past five years, well, it's, that would be 2005, even before that, you know, there's this new thing, content marketing, that's just seemed to be growing and growing and growing. I'm not seeing any end to it. What is content marketing, Josh? I mentioned it because you, you talk about it a lot in your book. Yeah. So content marketing is this idea of, you know, helping and communicating and sharing with your prospect, with your audience, with your potential customer without trying to sell them anything. So there, there's always that, that indirect benefit that people eventually who are engaged and love your stuff and follow you and trust you are pretty likely to buy something from you eventually. But it's a really different model where it's really bringing people inbound. So a lot of it starts with search. So if somebody's looking for 
how do I do X, Y, Z? How do I perform a brand audit is how a lot of people find us. So we are, depending on what way the wind's blowing at Google, in the top three for some how to find a brand audit, how to perform a brand audit kind of search. Um, and that's where a lot of traffic comes to us. And we have a lot of free tools that are available for people if they want to perform a brand audit or even think about what are all the things that I should look at before I uh, think about rebranding my firm. Um, and we just provide all that stuff for free. Hundreds, hundreds, if not thousands of people uh, download this tool. Uh, we get something like 1,200 views of that page uh, every month. So literally thousands of people have downloaded it at this point. We don't have thousands of clients and that's okay. You know, just the, the best clients who stay engaged, who join our email list and they like what we have to say, you know, it's something that helps to, to, to warm up that relationship and create that extension so that we may be in Indianapolis, but you know, a client who might be in, in Portland, Oregon or Seattle, Washington, or, or New York or Florida or Canada, you know, we get leads from all over the place because people are finding and liking and appreciating those resources. And, and for us, it wasn't a set it and forget it where it's just, we have this brand audit out there and that's the, the only resource people have. Um, you know, we create new content. We try to create, um, two or three pieces of content every week. So, uh, our, our Tim, as we call him, our, who leads our, uh, our digital marketing production here at miles Herndon, Tim helps, uh, oversee and produce a lot of the digital marketing content and, helps us make sure that we're staying on schedule uh, and producing a lot of helpful stuff again, which is all the purpose of teaching and helping and uh, instructing on, on how to do these things better. What does content marketing mean for a professional services firm? So a good example would be to um, find a thing that your professional services firm has expertise in. And I'm certainly not advocating that you give away your, your secret sauce but how could you give a little bit more of a look into the process or give tips on, on how to do something? So whether it's um, how to create a more sustainable building envelope or, uh, you know, our firm may specialize in, in net zero or net positive energy design, you know, just talking through that stuff. Um, in, in the not so old days, we simply called that thought leadership, but I think sharing the way that you think and your unique point of view is a big part of what what fuels content marketing and also um, helps elevate your thought leaders and your the technical experts within your firm uh, to kind of show off a little bit to, to show what they do to show what they're capable of doing um, and and to really demonstrate your your point of view and your expertise have you thought about starting your own practice or are you looking to take your practice to the next level if so, I wanted to let you know that free registration for the 2016 Architecture Business Plan Competition opens on December 1st, 2015. Start your planning process now and enter for a chance to win a grand prize of $10,000. Five finalists will be flown to Philadelphia to present their full plans to four industry-leading jurors. Travel and lodging are provided. So this is a one-of-a-kind competition. It's open to all licensed architects in the United States and Canada who are planning to start a new firm within one year or currently own a firm that is less than 10 years old. Visit archbusinessplan.com to learn more. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. Views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.